here, church family. You know, Christmas is over, and soon the lights are going to go away, the trees are going to come down, the ornaments are going to be packed up and put away. And we had one Christmas come and go, and now we look forward to a new year. And you know, some people, there's three different ways that you can look forward to this new year, isn't there? Some people had a great year. Some people, when they say Happy New Year, they're thinking back on this last year, and they're thinking, it was great for me. Some people got promoted this year at work. Some people got raises. Some people had loved ones join the family and babies were born. Some people had a great year. Some people, very few, their year hasn't changed at all. To them, everything was just the same. They might have always worked from home before that and they don't get out of the house much and they're like, huh, COVID didn't do anything. I don't know any changes. But man, if you're one of them, well, you're probably watching online and... Um, you, you've always watched online, and you got to get out, <laughs> you know. But we had some, a few that had great years, some that had, you know, not much has changed. But for most of us, it's been a rough year. And when we say Happy New Year, we're saying Happy New Year. Yes, we're glad a new year is coming because <laughs> it's been a tough year, hasn't it? A lot of things have changed this year. They're not normal, and they're not how they're supposed to be. I mean, vacations were canceled. I mean, we, we were on vacation when all the lockdowns happened, and we were stuck in Florida for a while until we could come up, and man, we heard scary things, and we thought COVID was going to be this, would devastate us, and it was rough. But we didn't know how bad it was going to be. And then we went on vacation to Gatlinburg when things looked like it was going to get better, but you had to wear masks when you went in places. Only so many people could go in at a time. I mean, it was kind of a bummer. You know, I mean, things changed. School, I mean, for some people, it was their last year of high school, and they were really looking to a great year, and they have to, they're online. Some people were going to college for the first time. I mean, it's been a bummer year for a lot of, pe a lot of people. I mean, for some of us, um, work, I know a few people that were looking at getting promotions this year, and that didn't happen. It's been a bad year for some people. Some people lost their jobs entirely. Some, I mean, retreats and conferences were canceled. It's been a tough year. So when we say Happy New Year, we're looking forward to a better year. You know, it has some hope and some excitement in it. Some of our freedoms feel like they were taken away. Some people with the election... Some people are looking excited to a new administration. Some are scared about a new administration. A lot has happened in this last year, and more downs, it seems like, than ups. More downs than ups. And I think we can all say that we feel kind of alone, isolated, nervous about the future. And what's exciting about it is we have a book in the Bible written to people that might have felt a little bit isolated, alone, and fearful for the future. And today we're going to just look at the first few verses to that book. It's called First Peter. So if you have a Bible, if you can open up to First Peter, that would be great. We're going to take a look at First Peter in the first few verses. And let me read it to you. First Peter chapter 1. It's near the end of the Bible. If you hit Revelation, you went a bit too far. This back up to 1 John, and if you hit Hebrews, you didn't go far enough. 1 Peter 1, 1 says this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cap Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Okay. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. I think this is important because I want grace and peace to be multiplied to me this year. I need that. He goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has called us, caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you greatly rejoice, 
Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing, tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to resort in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, I think we need this message coming into a new year. And I think it's an important message. But do me a favor, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this has been a a good year for some, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the joys and the good things that happened this year, the connecting of families, families slowing down a little bit and seeing what's really important, new lives being born, people being, have, having fresh starts. And the, Lord, I pray for those of us that, have, that maybe had a rougher year, for those of us that feel isolated and alone, I just pray that we can live a life in this world with joy and being excited to see you again soon someday. Heavenly Father, I pray that you open up our eyes so we can see you. I pray that we'll leave this place knowing you and loving you so we'll want to go out and serve you even more. In Jesus' powerful and wonderful name, I pray, amen. Man, people are looking for joy everywhere these days, aren't they? They are, I just saw a commercial on TV about Ford trucks, and it said this. It said, Ford, always a way to make joy. Always a way to make joy. Buy a Ford truck. Yes, you will have some joy if you buy a Ford truck. But for how long? When you're making those payments three years later, and you're making the same payment you made on day one, and that truck might have a ripped front seat in it. The steering wheel is dirty. There's some stains on the ground where your coffee tipped over this, I mean, it's not as joyful three years later, is it? The joy fades away pretty quick. And it's true with everything in this life. This life seems to go from things start out great, and they fade away. And they're not so joyful after a while. It's true no matter what you do. Think about it. If you buy a new house, you love that house. It's a beautiful house. Three, four years later, you're just taking it for granted. Think about relationships. Relationships start out greatly on fire, and you're excited, and over time, you just take them for granted after a while, don't we? A new cell phone, you get a new cell phone, you're excited, you're joyful, you're excited for that cell phone. Man, it's a lot of fun to mess around with and have. A year later, they have a new one that's coming out, and yours is almost obsolete. The things in this world that we go to to create joy in our life do not last. But here in what I just read, three times Peter says we are to have joy. Three times he says we are to have joy. And we're going to look. We don't have time to get into the whole passage today, but we're going to look at some of the key points to help us have joy when we're living in a world that we feel isolated, maybe alone, and that seems kind of scary in the future ahead of us. But you have to remember that there is hope and joy that can be expressed outwardly, even in difficult times. Our joy comes not from our country, our family, our things, our stuff, but it comes from knowing who we are and having that right perspective. It comes from knowing who God is and what the outcome of all that is, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes. We must know that we were not made for this world. You have to know that. This world, you are not supposed to go to for your joy. It won't last. We have to learn how to live in a world that we were not made to be, that we're not meant to be in for long. We're only exiles. We're only passing through this world. And we have a mission and a job to do, and that's to glorify the king of kings. And you can't glorify the king of kings with a frown on your face, can you? People aren't going to be going, man, Your God must be amazing if you look like you just got a shot. It doesn't work that way. We are to glorify God with joy, Peter tells us. 
We are not called to build companies. We're not called to build empires and bank accounts and large retirement funds. We are not called to win championships, get great grades, to go to the school of our choice, to have our dream job. Those aren't things we're called to do. We are called to glorify God with joy in, as we live in a world that we will soon be leaving. And that's what we're called to do. And that's what Peter reminds us. So let's dig into it. Let's see what happens. But before we do, I want to let you know about who this Peter guy is. Because if you grew up in church, you know a lot about Peter. But if you didn't grow up in church, you might be saying, Peter, who's Peter? I have no idea who Peter is. So I just want to remind you that it's Peter who's writing this book. And he's writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to us. He was one of the 12 apostles or disciples who traveled with Jesus. And he was even more than that, he was in a select group of three that would spend extra time with Jesus. So Peter knew Christ. He lived with Christ for three years. In fact, he first met Jesus, if you remember, because he was in Jerusalem, and his brother was with a guy named John the Baptist, and John the Baptist pointed at Jesus one day and said, look, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Peter's brother followed Jesus, and then he said, hey, i got to let Peter know about this. And Peter's brother went and found Peter and took him to Jesus. And then a short time after that, sometime after that, after Peter already met Jesus, he's, Jesus is walking by the, the sea, and Peter is out just finishing up fishing, and Jesus calls him to follow him. And that happens two times, and Peter finally gets a hint and follows Jesus. Peter was a pretty amazing guy, but he wasn't a polished theologian like Paul was. Peter was more of, man, he told it how it was. He wasn't scared to say how things was. In fact, one time he even got on Jesus saying, Jesus, don't you go to Jerusalem. Don't you do that. That's foolish. And Jesus had to look at him and say, get behind me, Satan. Peter wasn't scared to say how he felt to people. Peter was one of the leaders of the early church. In fact, he was the first missionary to the Gentiles. He went to a, a Gentile soldier and shared Christ with him. But his ministry was mainly to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. So he was the first missionary to the Gentiles, but his missionary was mainly, I mean, his mission was mainly to Jewish people, but the only two books that he wrote were to Gentiles. Kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, it is. Paul, he went to the Jewish people at first, and he was mainly a missionary to the Gentiles, and he wrote books to both, you know. So Peter, even though his mission was mainly to one group of people, he wrote this book to us and to all Christians. Peter wrote to a people who were being, starting to get persecuted. They had to leave their homes. The persecution didn't start up fully yet. They weren't being killed for their faith yet. That was going to come shortly. But these people had to leave homes because people weren't buying and selling with them. They saw them as a bit odd. They weren't dealing with them. So they had to go other places throughout the world to make a living. And these people would have felt isolated. They would have felt out of place. They would have been alone. I mean, can you imagine going to a different country and living there? They were exiles. They weren't planning on staying. They wanted to come back home. And they were looking forward to coming back home someday. So they felt the isolation and the loss and the, the loss of freedoms. And this book is also written to us today. Peter had a over, yes, he wrote to those specific Christians at that time, but he also saw all Christians as exiles. We are all exiles, we're going to see in just a moment. And we all feel separated from people and not quite at place. And so if you ever felt a bit odd, there's a reason for that. And he wrote to them telling them you can still have joy, you can still have peace when you're out of your comfort zone, when you're someplace you don't want to be. And things are happening to you that are out of your control. You can still have joy and peace if we keep our focus right. So look at the very first thing what Peter says. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. An exile, I already said, is somebody that's living someplace they don't want to live. They're not expecting to stay there. They want to go home. He's writing to us. He's writing to us. 
This is not new in the Bible. Here, take a look, listen to some of these verses. In Psalms 119, 19, it says, I am a stranger in exile on earth. In 1 Chronicles 29, 15, it says this. It says, we are aliens and strangers. In Hebrews 11, that's like the hall of faith. Um, the writer of Hebrews writes about all these great Christians in the Old Testament, all these believers in the Old Testament, God followers in the Old Testament. And listen to what he writes about them. He writes, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted, they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. From here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. See, this idea of being an exile or a stranger on earth is not new to only Peter. It's throughout the whole Bible. In fact, Paul kind of hits on it in Philippians 1. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He, man, he's a stranger. He's an exile on this earth, and he wants to go and be with Christ. And he goes, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But for me to remain in the flesh is more necessary. Being an exile in, this, in the Bible is not new. In fact, it's normal. It's a normal thing that we should not, not be surprised of. And I think most Christians mentally understand this. I think most of us mentally would say, yes, we're exiles. This is not a home. But physically and functionally, I don't think we get it. I struggle with it physically and functionally. Functionally, we live like this is our home most of the time. Functionally, we live like, man, what I mean, this last election, you saw people arguing back and forth like I never saw in my life. And they're doing it because this world is their home, and they have to save and preserve what they have. People fought about their freedoms being taken away. We hold on to stuff, and we think that a new home, a new car, or the right family and the right relationship is what we need in this life. And we build this little mini empire around us that we want to protect and save and hold on to. But exiles don't do that, do they? Exiles don't do that. In fact, I think there's three ways, at least three ways that Christians live in this world. And one of them is an immigrant, one of them is like a vacationer, and one of them can be as an exile. And they all live a little bit different, don't they? An immigrant, how does an immigrant live? An immigrant leaves his country and moves to another country, and he wants to fit in. He's not planning on going home. He wants to make, or they want to make their country their home. When we have immigrants that come to America, they move to America, they become citizens of America, they take on our lifestyle, they take on our culture, they build a home here, and they're never planning on going back home. They're kind of like a chameleon if they could, and they want to fit in and blend in and be like those around them. Yes, they might hold on to a few things from their homeland, but if they do, they usually keep it inside their home or inside their community. And when they go out into the rest of, when they go to work and to school, they want to look and act like everybody else. They're immigrants. And I think a lot of Christians are like that. They come to church, they talk the church talk, they live the church life when they're in church, and when they go to work, when they go to school, when they go out in their community with their friends, nobody knows the difference. So we have Christians that live as immigrants. We also have Christians that live as vacationers, don't we? We have Christians that live as vacation. Think of when you go on vacation. You might go to Cancun, Mexico, or somewhere on vacation, and you go down there, you, you stay at your resort. You might jump out to see some local customs, but then you go back to your little safe place at night. You're on vacation. You're not planning on staying there. You're planning on going home, and you're just there for the fun of it. You never engage with the culture. You never engage with the people. What goes on there doesn't really concern you very much. Because you're planning on going home someday soon. You're just there on vacation, so you're just there for basically yourself. And we have a lot of Christians that do that and live like that. They isolate themselves in their own little group. And once in a while, they'll do rabbit hole evangelism where they'll jump out and share Christ with someone with a group of people. But then they jump back into their little holy huddle and they just have all Christian friends. And they never get out and engage the culture at all. And then we have those that get the idea and understand that they're immigrants. 
or an exile, I'm sorry, that they understand that they're in exile is the third one. An exile is someone that goes to another country. They don't really want to be there. No one wants to be in exile. But they go to another country with the intent of coming, going back home as soon as they can. They don't want to make it their home. Yes, they have to live there for a little while. They don't know how long. So they might have a home, but they don't hold on to the stuff there. They hold on to it with a loose hand, knowing that someday they're going to go back and leave almost everything behind where they're now staying because they want to go back to their homeland. And when they, and, but they do get involved with the people around them, and exile does have to work. They do have to feed themselves. They do meet the community. They go out in the community. They invest in the community. But they invest in the community, and when they do, they let people know who they are. And they tell people about their homeland and where they want to go back to and what's going on and why they want to go back there. And we have Christians that do live like that. That's how we're supposed to live. We are here in this world, but it's not our home. That means we don't build the stuff. When we build a house, yes, we, we have a house to live in, but we have it with our loose and open hand, meaning if God wants us to move, we have to be willing to move. It's not really our house. This is not our home. This is not where we're getting our security and our purpose and our meaning. We want to go home to be with him someday. We're looking forward to not being here any longer, but be being with Christ. That's why Christ came and died and rose again for us. We're told in 1 Peter 3.18, he did that so he could bring us to God, so we can be with him in our forever home with him. That means that the stuff in this life, yes, it should concern us. We want to reach out to the poor. We want to tell people about Christ. We want to tell people about a better country that they can go to someday too. We interact with them. We engage with them. And it means that we're kind of weird. It means people won't see us as normal. It means people, because we have different values that we're still holding on to. We have different morals. We have a different perspective. And people will see that as weird. They won't see it as normal. It's kind of like if you're watching a football game and at halftime the band comes out and is playing and every band person is moving in the same direction at the same time and to the same beat. And there's one kid out there that has earbuds in that's listening to somebody else. And his step is off this a little bit. You know, they go up this way and he goes the other way. And you can, and man, and you can just tell something's a little bit off, right? You're sitting there going, yeah, you're not quite there. You know, well, that's us. Because we're listening to somebody else. Our heart is beating for someone else. So the world would look at a Christian and say, man, there's something off with that person. Don't Don't quite know what it is, but there's something different. And that's good. It's a good thing. Let me just tell you, if you're non-Christian friends, and I hope you have non-Christian friends, you're not, because we are told that we're supposed to be in the world, but we're not of it. And if our non-Christian friends don't see us as a little bit odd, maybe there's something wrong. If you have non-Christian friends and they just see you as one of the good old boys, or on girls' night out, they just see you as one of the other girls, and they don't see that there's something a little bit different, Maybe, maybe it's because you're not. It could be because I think of two different reasons. It might be because you only know about Jesus Christ, but you don't know him personally. He never came into your life and gave you a new heart of flesh that beats for him and loves him and wants to be more like him. Maybe it's just because you know about Christ, but you don't know him. Or it could be the other reason that I thought of this week is maybe because you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You want to be like the lost, and you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're not listening to him. You're not repenting when he convicts you. And a Christian that's living like that will never be joyful in this life. If you're lacking that joy as an exile, as you live here on this earth, it might be because we're blending in too much. (laughs) Maybe you're taking on the characteristics of this world, and you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, this world won't treat Christians very nice because it doesn't like people that aren't like themselves. Most exiles aren't treated very nice in the the country they go to. People see them as odd, strange, so they treat people that are odd and strange as a little bit off. I mean, they might smile at you and they're nice to you, but they don't fully accept you. 
They might even persecute you. They might look down upon you. They might call you weird names. They might say you're intolerant, unloving. They might even persecute you physically, emotionally. But we have to remember it's only temporary. Exiles are only somewhere temporary. It's not permanent. This world is not our home. We will go to be with him soon. So being in exile means that we have to remember that we belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if you are a born-again Christian, you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the only hell you ever know. Did you ever realize that? It gets better, unbelievably, that words can't even describe when we're with him. This is the only hell we'll ever know it is on this earth. It also means that it also means that we want to be with him. I mean, it really bugs me when I ask somebody, and I know they don't really mean it, so if you said this to me, I didn't think anything, but I, when this week I was thinking about it, and when I ask somebody, how are you doing? And they tell me, well, I woke up this morning, so it's a good day. No, 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 no. The truth is, if we would have wo- opened our eyes up and we were with Jesus Christ, it would have been the glorious day. The best day is when we're with him, not when we're here waiting to be with him. And exiles know that. And it means that where we live on this earth doesn't matter that much. Exiles don't fight to live in one area or another. They want to go wherever their Lord wants them to go when they're on this earth. Because this earth is not our home. It means that we're not holding on to the things on this earth to bring us happiness and joy. We're willing to let them go for the sake of letting people know about our king and our homeland that we're going to someday. And it means that we have to keep our eyes focused on our creator God. Because if we take them off of him, if we, take, if we don't remember where we're going, we're going to end up living like everyone else around us. It means we live different. And you might be saying, Pastor Jim, what does that look like? How do we live different? And here, let me just show you, according to Luke chapter 6, Jesus actually tells us a few ways that we do live different. And let me point those out to you real quick. I think these are perfect. Because if you live this way, the world is going to see you as odd and different. But this is how I believe in exile, how we're supposed to live. So Luke 6, verse 27 says this. But I say, not me, but Jesus. So don't get mad at me about this stuff. This is Jesus saying this to us, okay? It says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Man, we just went through a rough election. Did either side love the enemy? It's weird, all right? If you do this, you're going to be seen as weird. Love your enemies. It goes on and says, do good to those who hate you. Man, my flesh does not say that. My flesh says, avoid people that hate me. I'm not necessarily going to hurt them back. If somebody hates me, I don't even want to go by them. I'm going to avoid them. This says, do good. Go out of your way to do something good to them. That means you have to interact with them. I can't avoid them. I have to look them out. I mean, I got to go to where they're at. Do good to my enemies. This is weird stuff. Bless those who curse you. If somebody curses me, I want to say something bad about them back. I mean, don't you? I mean, if somebody says that I'm weird, or if somebody says, man, look, they're disciplining this kid like that. They shouldn't be doing that. I want to go back and defend myself. I don't want to say a blessing on them. I don't want to say something good about them. I want to defend myself. It goes on and says, pray for those that abuse you. Notice it doesn't say stay in that situation. If someone's abusing you, you do want to get out of there, but you want to pray for them. You pray for those that abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, all... Offer the other also. If somebody, that's, this, 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 that's what they did to insult you back then. If someone insults you, let them insult you right back again. Man, I want to again defend myself. You know? This is weird stuff. This is hard stuff. If you do this stuff, you can see why people are going to think you're a bit odd. Because huh? in school and everywhere, we're taught to stand up for ourselves. You are special. You're important. Don't let other people look down on you like that. This is going contrary to everything we learn and hear and think. He goes on. Look, it gets even worse. It says here, 
It says, if someone takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic as well. If they take my sweater, here, here's my shirt also. Man, living as an exile is difficult. Give to everyone who begs from you. The guy in the street corner gives to everyone that begs. If he asks you, he says, give to everyone. It doesn't, my, what I'm told by people around me is, man, they're going to spend it on drugs or alcohol or something. You got to know what they're going to spend it on. Don't give it to them. Jesus says, give to all who begs. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish others to do to you, do unto them. Man, if someone takes something from me, if someone takes my phone, I'm not supposed to demand it back. What's going on? See, we're exiles. This world's not our home. We're living with another better home in paradise that will never fade or spoil or get polluted. And we have to remember that. And then if we do, we can live this way more, not in our own strength, because Jesus Christ, who said these words to us, if you know Jesus Christ, he lives in you, and he can empower you to do this stuff. If you try to do this on your own, you're going to get worn out. But if you do it in the strength and power of Jesus Christ, you can live this way. Here, this, let me finish up real quick here. It says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love themselves. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who you expect to receive back, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. There's that love again. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the devil. Be merciful, even as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Man, we're supposed to be kind to people even if they're rotted to us. Because did you see what I read at the end there? Most people skip this. It says here at the very end, he said this. He said, And you will be sons of the Most High, for he, that's God, is kind to the ungrateful and the devil. And we're supposed to be like our Heavenly Father. Man, if someone is not nice to us, if someone is persecuting us, if someone is getting on us, we can still be kind. Doesn't mean you stay in that situation, like I said. Doesn't mean you unite with them. You don't do any of that. But it means that you're kind to them, that you love them, that you can pray for them, that you can say a blessing upon them. That's what aliens and exiles do. And that is really hard to do. And you can see why the world would look down upon us. You can see why they would say we're a bit odd, we're a bit weird. But we have to remember that this is what we're called to do. We have to remember that because it's not a mistake. You're not an exile by mistake. Look at verse number two. It's important. Verse two says, oh, I closed my Bible. <laughs> verse two says, according, we are exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood. Being an exile, we were chosen to be an exile. It says we're elect exiles. God chose this for you. He chose this for me. It's not a mistake. It's not a flaw in the plan. You are chosen by him, for him, and to him. That's huge because God is sovereign. That means he's in control of all things. And God in his sovereignty placed us here as exiles. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? That it's just not a mistake, that he just didn't mess up. We are chosen for this in God's sovereignty. We're chosen to be exiles because we are chosen to be holy and dearly loved by God. Isn't that a good thing? We're chosen because we're holy, because to be holy, set apart for God, because he loves us so much. If you ever doubt your love for God, just remember what he says in Romans 5 to us. He says this, he says, you were you, that God died for us when we were still sinners. Out of his great love, he died for us when we were still sinners. He loved us so much that even when we didn't love him, he died for us. God loves you. He chose you because he loves you. And never forget that. And not only that, he chose us but he's also sanctifying us, it says there. What does that mean? What does sanctifying mean? But when you get saved, because he chose you, 
and you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he sanctifies you. He sees you already as, he, you, as you don't see yourself. He sees you as holy and pure and blameless. The problem is we don't live like that, do we? So he's in the process of sanctifying us to making us more like him, to helping us live who we already are. See, we are children of God, holy and made right before God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. But we don't live like that. And, he, and the Holy Spirit uses persecution, this exile, to help us to become more like him every single day. So there's a purpose of it. We're living here as chosen exiles so we can become more like Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit when we dig into the word and the Holy Spirit convicts us and we yield to him and what he teaches. So he's sanctifying us through the word of God as we yield to him. But not only that, it says, man, through the, for the sprinkling of his blood, he saves us. So we're chosen to be exiles, to be sanctified, to grow more like him, and also to be saved by him. Isn't that an amazing thing? What does that mean, the sprinkling of his blood? I don't understand how that has anything to do with being saved, and it has to do with, you go back to the Old Testament, I'm not going to dig that in much into it, I'm just going to, but they had these sacrifices that pointed to Jesus Christ's ultimate sacrifice, and these sacrifices, they would kill a lamb, and they would sprinkle the blood to purify you and to make you clean again, basically, and those sacrifices were only temporary, but when Jesus Christ came to earth, when the creator of the universe came and was born in a manger, and he lived the life we should have lived, he never sinned one time. He was a sinless lamb, the perfect sacrifice. He went to the cross, and he died in our place for our sins. And that was the last blood sacrifice that ever had to be shed. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're covered with the blood of Christ, as the old song says. We're covered with the blood. We're washed in the blood. And were made clean before God. And God chose you for that. He elected you for that. You are sprinkled with his blood. And why does he do all this? He does it for the, so we can be obedient now to Jesus Christ. We can live and be obedient to Jesus Christ. We can live out what we read in Luke 6. Because Jesus Christ comes and takes out our heart of stone. And we trust in him and him alone as our Lord and Savior, and he puts in the heart of flesh that now beats for him, and he lives in us, and when he convicts us, we can yield to him, and we can obey what he tells us to do. We don't have to obey him. This is important. You don't have to obey him. You get to obey him now. You want to obey him. You want to become like your father. That's huge, because look at it. It says here, in, at the end of verse 2, it says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. It doesn't say, may you just have grace and peace. It says, may it be multiplied to you, multiplied, even more so than ever before. Because when we understand that we get grace and peace, man, a lot of Christians don't understand this. They think we're saved by faith, but now we have to work to get God's blessing. But here we're told, no, no, God chose us. He sanctifies us. He, he saves us. He's the one that does it all. So now we get to obey him. We don't have to. We get to because he's already blessed us. His blessing is already upon us. And the more we understand that, the more that frees us up to want to live for him even more. Because if I think I have to please someone by what I do when I mess up, I think I failed. I'm no good anymore. But when I understand that God sees me as holy before him and he loves me unconditionally and there's nothing I can do that would stop him from loving me, when I understand that, when I mess up, I don't feel guilty and say I'm no good anymore. Yes, I'm convicted, and I confess that to him, and I get right back up, and I start serving him even more because I realize how much he loves me, that he chose me. So grace and peace is multiplied to us because we realize we don't have to obey him to get his blessing. We obey him because we already have his blessing. It's a big deal. It's huge because that's the only way we'll learn to yield to him is when we listen to him. But you can say, but Pastor Jim, wait a minute. I don't just, but I don't feel like that. I understand that I'm chosen. I understand that I'm saved. I understand that he's using this to make me more like him, but I don't have that joy you talked about. I don't have that ex 
overextending joy. It seems like more of a burden to me. I understand that. I've been through those times in my life too. And I'm going to tell you something to help you out real quick that I challenge you to do. If you don't feel this joy, but you, you know you're chosen by God, you know he saved you, and you know he's using your exile to sanctify you, to make him more like you, but you just lost that joy and excitement, let me challenge you to pray the IOUs. You want to pray the IOUs. And I got these all from the Psalms. And the first one is incline your heart to God. It, pray for God to turn your heart to him. Because I have so many things in this life that are good things that my heart is inclined to. That means focused on, like my kids and my wife. And I pray, God, turn my heart to you. And then I pray the O is open my eyes to how wonderful your word is. Because most of the time when we read the Bible, when we lose that joy, we're reading it to see what we can get out of it. No, God, open my eyes so I can see you in your word. When you read the Bible, you want to see who God is and what he's done. And then you pray, pray the you, which is, God, help me have an undivided heart. Help my heart be united with yours. Because if he gave me a new heart, it should be. But so many times, if I'm inclined, if I'm looking at other things to bring me happiness, if I'm not reading the Bible to see how great he is, my heart gets divided. So God, get rid of anything in me that's causing me to have a divided heart to you. And then finally, the S is satisfy me with your love. God, don't satisfy me with a new cell phone, with a raise, with a healthy family. Satisfy me with you, God, first of all, above everything else. And if you do this, and if you pray the IOUs over time, you will find that joy when you're living as an exile because you will realize that you're chosen, that you're loved, that you're saved, and he's sanctifying you in this new year no matter what is to come. So can you just take a moment with me as we pray? And if you can, just stand to your feet. If you're at home, you can stand to your feet if you want. Um, and let's just pray that God will do this for us this year. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you now. It's been a tough year. It's been a hard year for a lot of us. And most of us know after this year what it's like to be a little bit isolated, to lose our freedoms, to be someplace we don't want to be. We know what it's like to be in exile. And help us to live a joyful life when we're in exile because we're looking to you. Because we know that we're chosen by you. Because we know that we're saved because of what you did for us. That we know that you're using this to help us to be more like you. And let us live that out with joy that others can see, that we can go out and tell others about you and they'll see that joy in us and want what we have. Lord, I come to you now for those here that may not be feeling that joy, but they know you and love you. I pray that their hearts will be inclined to you, that you just turn their hearts to you this morning. I pray that they'll open their, their eyes when they read the Bible to see how wonderful you are. I pray that they'll have a heart that's united with yours for the things you want and desire. And I pray that you will satisfy them with you. With you that they won't go to the things in this life, if there's anything in this life that is taking the place of you, that they'll, you give them the strength to get rid of that so they'll only rely and focus on you. Heavenly Father, if there's someone here today or listening today that doesn't, that they have not known you, if they're saying, I don't even think I'm an exile, I think I'm more like a resident to this world, I pray that this morning that they'll realize that Jesus Christ came to this earth and lived the life they should have lived that he went to the cross and died and rose again. And I pray this morning that they'll confess with their mouth that he is their Lord and Savior. That they'll just, in their head, pray a prayer or something like this. Heavenly Father, I know that you sent Jesus Christ and that he died in my place and rose again. Help him to be my Lord and Savior. I confess with my mouth today that he's my king. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you did that this morning, let one of the let Pastor Dan or me or Pastor Doug know. And you guys, as you go out and you, for this new year coming up, remember that we're exiles, and let's live like it this year. I'm excited to do that with you as a church family. You guys have a blessed year.